You picked a pastor's daughter to be best friends with, like, you know. I know sometimes pastor's kids gets bad reps, but we've been pretty blessed with some great pastor's kids here. I know that. Actually, every church that I've worked at, we've had awesome pastor's kids. It's pretty great. So I'm so thankful that that's the table that she chose to sit at. They, 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 do, they do games on Sunday, on, 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 during lunch where one of them will sing a little bit of a worship song and the other one has to, to, to figure it out and, and complete the song. But that's awesome. How many, how many of you guys want your kid to be sitting at that table, right? I'm so blessed and so thankful. Communities, though, the communities that we're in, they have the power to challenge and to change and to cherish us as individuals. We set the table. We set the expectations that shape our communities. One of the great things about this Pokemon table that I sit at is that... Um, one of the guys, I would even maybe even call him like the leader. He's just so well known in this community. He's at every rate. He's a, uh, a, v uh, a Vietnam War vet who actually uses this for physical therapy or, or therapy for his PTSD. And, uh, and he will say, uh, and he will tell people, it's like, listen, we're going on these church properties. You're going to respect that place. You know, like he, he, he insists, you know, you're not going to pull up on the, on, the, on the curb. Do you know that there's a church right here in Dunlop, and I'm not going to say the name, but they have kicked this Pokemon crew, crew out of, they don't want them on their property. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, here we have the church. And we, these people are practically coming to our property. We need to show love to them. But he's so, he's setting the, the table and saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to abide and be respect all of these places that we go and we play at. In fact, anytime they, sometimes they even go to the city and just say, hey, there's an event coming up and there's going to be a lot of people in the city uh, playing this week. So, so that's important for us. All right, number three. We need to be looking for people under the table. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. We need to be looking for people under the table. Well, that sounds a little weird. But this passage that we looked at on Wednesday at camp is pretty interesting when it comes to what, he me what we mean by this. It's, Luke, it's Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. It says this, Just as a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He said, listen, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel for right now. But he came, but she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, Great is your faith. Let it be done for you, for you as you wish. And his daughter was immediately healed. There would be time, like the Canaanites were not following the God of Israel. They were, they were kind of doing their own thing. And so, Peter, so Jesus is trying to make this point here. But he recognizes this woman believes and has faith in God and blesses her because of it. But I, I, if you were eating dinner and there was a hungry dog under the table, how many of you guys would give it food? Yeah, raise your hand. Like, be for real. Like, there's a hungry dog under the table. Man, you guys don't have your hands up. You are mean. <laughs> no, for real. Like, my dad, he would not be like, go lay down. You know, he's like, come here, man. Come here. Have my Brussels sprouts, right? You know, like, we're all... <laughs> seriously. Seriously. Like... That's for real. We would probably, most of us would probably give it food. What if there was a hungry person under your table? What would you do? Well, listen, there are many reasons that people are under the table. It could be their race, their class, their sexuality, their gender. Some have never even been invited to come up to the table. Some choose to be under the table because that's where they'd like to be. But that's not where God wants us to be. I, I, when I, we were talking about this on Wednesday in our small group, there's this little girl. She's maybe 11, 12 years old. And uh, we were talking about this passage. And she says, I have a friend whose dad just died. I mean, that's sad because they're only 11 or 12 years old and their, their father passed away. And she said, you know, I've invited her to the youth group, invited her to church, and she just won't come. 
And she's so mad at God. She has no desire to come to church. She has no desire to come up to the table. And, and I'm thinking, as the youth minister, as the adult volunteer, something to say to her, something to help encourage her. And so I'm, I'm just about to say something. And this little 11-year-old girl says, I guess that means I need to go down with her under the table. 11 or 12 year old girl I'm supposed to be the one with the answers nope she had it sometimes for the people who are under the table we need to go to them we can't expect them remember our table looks weird we serve pancakes at, at dinner <laughs> oh it, Peter, Peter is another great example who denied Jesus three times and three times, Jesus asked him to do something. Anybody remember after this is all said and done, what did he ask him to do? Feed a, sheep. Feed a sheep, right? Three times, feed my sheep. Jesus restores him. And he tells Peter, you need to go and feed my sheep. The woman asks for crumbs at the table. These are instances it's where it's very clear that all who come to Jesus can and will receive the full benefit of his blessings, regardless of their race, regardless of their culture or other differences. Allowing people to live under the table is contrary to the gospel of Jesus. He's very clear about this. He wants us to treat how he wants to treat each other. Though we might disagree on how to do it sometimes, he wants us to feed his people. He wants us to make room at the table, to pass them a plate. All right, turn over to Mark chapter 11. This is Thursday, Mark chapter 11. He gives us number four. Occasionally in the pursuit of justice, we may need to overturn the tables. Oh, y'all all already know what this scripture is, don't you? You know what it is. Mark chapter 11. It says, verse 15, Mark chapter 11, verse 15, it says this. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teachings. And when we asked the students, how do you think Jesus felt walking into the temple that day? And the room was split on two answers. One was sadness and the other was anger. It's interesting though because Jesus' anger is a righteous anger, not a responsive anger. Sometimes a guy cuts you off and your anger may not be so righteous. It just may be responsive. What do you think you're doing? Right? But Jesus, it's interesting because the two emotions that they identified with in that moment, I think are the two, uh, two emotions that sometimes we identify when we see injustice going on. I'm going to flip over to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. You don't have to go there if, if you don't want to. But it's Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. And we put this one on the screen. It says, One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing the no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge to over us? To use our privilege to overturn tables and systems of oppression. You know, we have uh, a, an event that we do at the end of the summer every year called Linked. And um, it's called Linked because about six or seven churches link together and do this event. It's kind of like a teen vacation Bible school, but we don't really call it that because sometimes students might say, oh, vacation Bible school is for babies. But in the past couple years, 
I don't know if we planned it this way or if just God just said, kind of put this on our hearts, that we've been using Linked to help focus on some social injustices in the world. You might have heard and seen stories about how all these students went walking on the beach for five miles carrying a jug of water to help raise money for building a well in Africa. Uh, last year they went 30 hours without food to help raise money for a uh, 30-hour famine and world vision and how they help those who are in need in Hungary. Well, this year I'm super excited um, because we are teaming up with the Children's Home Society and this year our focus is going to be on human trafficking to bring awareness to human trafficking that is in our area, but also to help raise funds for this organization that is here that helps students specifically on being rescued from human trafficking. Um, oftentimes when people are rescued from human trafficking, they don't have what they need uh, to be able to continue their life or to get the help they need. So. Uh, one of the great things, uh, Christy Gillis, who works with Children's Home Society, and she was in the first service, walked out the minute I was about to acknowledge her. <laughs> but um, she has been really helpful in helping us organize this. And what we've decided to do is that one of the last Saturdays in the summer, our students are going to do a bike relay. Because one of the things that we learned when we put all the churches on a map that each and every church is almost exactly four miles apart. How, how crazy is that, that each one is almost exactly four miles apart? And, uh, and so we're going to do a bike relay starting at First United Methodist Church of Ormond. And, man, I don't know how Pastor Tom does this each week. This thing is driving me nuts. Um, but we're gonna, they're going to be carrying on their backs a backpack filled with some things that maybe somebody who's been rescued from human trafficking can use. Things like new clothes or uh, some new school supplies, things like that. And they're going to travel four miles. We've already got uh, the awareness and, and possibly the support of local law enforcement that are either going to ride with the students or give us a police escort um, on this Saturday. Saturday, I think it's the 4th. And so one of the, the other cool thing is that they're going to they're carry these backpacks and then they're going to meet up at the next church and then pass off the backpacks. And we're going to go all the way from First UMC Ormond all the way down to the Port Orange Police Station uh, where we're going to drop off those backpacks. And each, each group, each church of seven is going to drive, is going to ride four miles. We're going to ask the students to, to seek pledges for that where it's four miles. So they, maybe they can ask for a dollar a mile or two dollars a mile or three dollars a mile, whatever, uh, to help raise funds. And the awesome thing about this is that it's going to help students who have been rescued from human trafficking right here in Volusia County. Your students are overturning tables. So awesome. Number five, last one. We are called to be servants at the table. This last passage is on the screen. It's from the uh, Common English Bible. It's from Romans 12, verse 4 through 8. It says this. We have, many we have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though there were many of us, there is only one body in Christ. And individually we belong to each other. We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace and have been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, then you should pros prophesy in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do it with no strings attached and the leader should lead with passion. The one showing mercy should be cheerful. If you think about all the ways that Jesus served people, he was setting the example of how we should love and serve one another. It, it, it can be something as simple as just listening. You know, listening is one of our simplest ways that we can imitate Jesus in our encounters with others. Just listen to where they are. Do you know how many times Jesus just stopped and listened to the person who was coming to him looking for help? When you go to the when you go to the uh, to the to a restaurant and your server comes, their job is to serve you. If they just came in and said, "Hey, today you're going to be having the bowl of clam chowder along with," the, you're not going to be very happy because they're not going to be listening to what it is you need. It can be real. I mean, it, it could be it could be real important for each of us to make sure that we're doing that. I, I want to be real with you for uh, something else too. That list of things that we do to serve those in need in the church that I read earlier. The really crazy thing is that there's about 10% of the people in this church that do about half of those things. 
I mean, you've heard it say, you know, 20% of the church is doing 80% of the work. There, are you missing out on an opportunity for you to use your gifts in ways to help those who are in need? Because that shouldn't be the way. Jen Linton read this passage when we started. I want to close with it. It's from 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11. This is from the NIV. It's a little bit different version, but it says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks to the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This was a verse that they, our students read every single day in small group. It's how they close the day. Because, and I love this too. If you're actually reading this in, in, uh, in 1 Peter, it's not the end of the book. It sounds like it's the end, right? Okay, turn to page 2 Peter. No, he's still got more to talk about. But he was so inspired in that moment when God gave him those words that he felt like, man, this is so awesome. Thank you. Glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Okay, I got a couple more things to say. But he was just so, I mean, it's such a great verse that helps wrap up how we are supposed to be living as Christians. Listen, each of us are blessed. And it's our responsibility to share those blessings by coming to the table because you've been invited. Everyone's been invited to the table, right? Say it. I've been invited to the table. <laughs> Then we're here and we have to set the table. So say, I'm setting the table. <laughs> then, if we need to, we may need to pull people from underneath the table. Say, I'm going to pull people from underneath the table. <laughs> and sometimes I might have to overturn the table. You could say that. <laughs> but I know I need to serve the best I can. I need to serve the best I can at the table because that's the reason. The reason because there is love at the table, just as there is love at this table. When Christ came, he set this table for each one of us. There is love at this table, and God invites you all. And I'm going to invite Pastor Howard to come as he leads us in our communion time.